This morning, they were attacked by the Slovenians at six o'clock. They took two dead, they captured two prisoners. Now they're going to be moving on to another location to reduce the risk of being attacked again. One road in Slovenia, one unit of the powerful Yugoslav army trapped. They're worried the roadblock set up by Slovenian militiamen is mined, booby-trapped. They begin to force their way through, then suspicious call for air support. They destroy the roadblock. The Yugoslav ground troops need all the help they can get. At daybreak, Slovenian militiamen surprise them from the forest, firing bazookas, killing two, wounding three. They were caught by surprise, tired after three days without food and water, cut off by the Slovenians. Wait a minute. This soldier said, I've had enough, I want to go home. It's a humiliating scene for the Yugoslav army, humbled here by poorly equipped Slovenian militiamen. And the army warned today, its period of restraint is over. On Yugoslav television, the army chief of staff said, the army will make sure the war that has been imposed on it will be as brief as possible. The army's big stick began to come out today. Three air attacks on Slovenian communication centers attempts to black out Slovenia's radio, television and telephones. Artillery fire in the hills near Austria aimed at Slovenian militiamen who surrounded federal troops. And fighter bombers roared over the regional capital, Ljubljana, sending citizens scurrying for shelter. But it was just a warning, no bombs fell. But in neighboring Zagreb, the Croatian capital, quiet until now, a warning from the people. When federal army tanks left their barracks, about a thousand people attacked with stones and gasoline bombs. A warning that the Yugoslav army may have the power, but not the support of all the people to use it. As for their two prisoners, the Yugoslav army officer freed them. Lucky the camera's around, he told them, otherwise I'd kill you. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Otacek, Slovenia. Yugoslav forces roll toward the breakaway republics as that nation moves toward all-out civil war. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Tonight, sitting in for Tom, is Mary Alice Williams. Good evening. The situation in Yugoslavia tonight remains on the razor's edge. The central government won't bend. It vows to hold its republics together. But the republics of Slovenia and Croatia won't yield. They demand independence. The wild card in all this? The Yugoslav army. NBC's Martin Fletcher is in Slovenia. The cavalry is coming, or so it seems. 180 tanks and armored personnel carriers left the Yugoslav capital, Belgrade, headed towards the breakaway republics of Slovenia and Croatia. Near the Croatian border, they split up. Some headed back towards Belgrade. The rest split into three. Until now, the Yugoslav army has committed only 5% of its forces to Slovenia. Croatian spokesman said if the tanks cross into Croatia, this will be, quote, understood as the beginning of war. And the Slovenians say if the convoy crosses into Slovenia to reinforce the Yugoslav army, fighting will probably break out again. That will be against the wishes of Serbia's parliament, which voted this morning to bring the army home out of Slovenia. But army leaders ignored parliament and ignored protesters, mothers of soldiers who also called on the soldiers to come home. A peace movement is building up in the Yugoslav capital. That all led the German foreign minister to warn the Yugoslavs. He said, quote, the army has forsaken all political control and has ran amok. If the civilians don't get control back, he said, there'll be a bloodbath. But it isn't clear to what extent the Yugoslav army leaders really control all levels of their army. Garrisons cut off, hungry, tired, are under intense strain. This woman brings food to a relative and says the fighting should end. But the officer was angry. He insisted news of low morale was a lie, propaganda, and he warned the Slovenians, we are all one country and we'll fight to keep it that way. However, these soldiers deserted from the officer's garrison. We found them in a Slovenian jail, just as the Red Cross negotiated their release. And they all said the same thing. I don't have a heart to, to shut the people. They don't want to fight against their own countrymen and prefer to desert and risk the punishment. Many more feel the same way, they said, 
but are afraid. This is the end of the line for these soldiers, these deserters, no more war for them. But one of them told us he no longer wanted to fight for the Yugoslav army, but would be willing to fight for the army of his own republic. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Celia, Slovenia. Yugoslavia edged back slightly today from the precipice of civil war. The breakaway Republic of Slovenia began releasing captured soldiers. And Yugoslavia's president said he would not use force to reunite the country. It's been 10 days since Slovenia declared its independence. NBC's Martin Fletcher is there tonight. 24 hours into the latest ceasefire, the guns are silent, though for both sides, laying down their arms is still a gamble. Neither side is fully implementing the deal. Most Yugoslav army troops have returned to barracks, and they have until Sunday to complete the move. But the Slovenian militias have mostly stayed put. They say they can't go back to barracks. They don't have any. They're all reserves, and it's premature to just go home. Roads are supposed to be clear of barricades, but although many buses and trucks are gone, anti-tank traps have taken their place. And most Slovenian barricades around the Yugoslav army barracks are still there hardly sticking to the letter of the agreement or even the spirit. But as long as the guns remain silent, a peaceful solution appears more likely. And it looks as if Slovenia may surprise itself and get what it wanted, independence. But why would two million people defy the might of the Yugoslav army? Well, Slovenia was an independent state once before, 800 years ago. And it's a dream, a memory that has never died. Every Slovenian village and town has its defiant memory of the last war, partisans fighting the outside invader. That's how Slovenians still see their world. The Germans have been replaced by the Yugoslavs, and independence has been grabbed at last. It had to come, says Slovenia's foreign minister. Great, great differences, economic, cultural, linguistic. Slovenia, Slovenes are a nation. It's a small state, a small nation, but uh, there are 60 States, members of the United Nations, which are smaller than Slovenia. Slovenia is the richest of the six republics that make up Yugoslavia, paying one-third of the federal budget. Slovenes are fed up subsidizing what they call the lazy Serbs. But above all, Slovenia's ambitions lie in the West, not the East. Who, who doesn't want to join Europe? I mean, I don't want to, to be a foreign minister of, of, of a backward, you know, country stashed away under some, you know, mattress. You know. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Good evening. In Yugoslavia, efforts to avoid a full-scale civil war are at an impasse tonight. That, according to the official Yugoslav news agency, European foreign ministers meeting with leaders of the various groups in the crisis today failed to get an agreement to halt the violence, and there was more of it this day. In Croatia, Croatians and Serbs clashed. Five people are dead, 24 wounded. In Slovenia, the government there refused to give up control of its border post. That despite an ultimatum from the federal government that it give up that symbol of sovereignty. Martin Fletcher is in Slovenia. The Yugoslav ultimatum expired at noon, but nothing happened. In fact, the Slovenian capital, Ljubljana, looked more like it had weathered the storm than was expecting a new one. The Slovenians rejected the Yugoslav ultimatum to demilitarize its border posts. They did try to compromise by pulling out their militiamen and replacing them with policemen. It isn't clear, though, if this will satisfy Yugoslavia. Tanks appeared out of place in the border posts that are once again open to traffic, although few tourists are visiting Yugoslavia this summer. And the Slovenians proudly displayed tanks they'd captured intact from the Yugoslav army, then painted over in their own colors. Slovenia's first tank unit is born and will be useful if fighting resumes. A European peace delegation brought together the warring heads of Yugoslavia's republics to try once more to head off war. Now we would like first to uh, ensure the ceasefire and to find uh, some interim agreements for the most uh, complicated points, like the situation at the borders, tariffs, and so. The European countries backed up their words with action. The European community ordered an arms embargo on Yugoslavia and the breakaway republics and suspended economic aid worth one billion dollars. But the meeting did not solve the crisis, just kept the peace process alive. Is this the last chance, do you think, for peace? One of the last. <laughs> Slovenia's fight with the federal government looks minor compared to what is brewing in neighboring Croatia. Here, the ethnic mess is most pronounced. Serbs, surrounded by Croatians, appealing to other Serbs for help. 
The Yugoslav army tries to keep the peace, but as the army is dominated by Serbs, Croatians accuse it of being a Serbian tool. It isn't helped by the Serbian president who told Serbs to prepare for war and warned Croatians he would never allow Serbs to be cut off from other Serbs. A massive hint that the Yugoslav army will annex part of Croatia and form what is being called the Greater Serbia. The European peace mission looks as if it cannot stave off what looks more and more likely a murderous civil war. The only question is, will that civil war be confined to Croatia or include Slovenia too? Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Ljubljana, Slovenia. ...nationalistic dreams that turn Yugoslavia into an ethnic nightmare. If one place sums up the hopelessness of Yugoslavia, this is it. Knin, 50,000 Serbs living surrounded by Croatians. They all live in hatred and fear, but they share one dream, the breakup of Yugoslavia. They just can't hack it together, constant battles between neighbors. For 70 years, Serbs and Croatians have lived a tragic tale of killings and revenge. The high point, or low point, was the Second World War when Croatians formed a Nazi puppet government and slaughtered half a million Serbs in concentration camps. But the killing goes both ways, and today, Serbs, although surrounded by Croatians, feel stronger. It's like a hillbilly feud between families, become a feud between nations. Will the peace talks end the conflict? So I don't believe in the possibility of total control of the events by, by the government or by the army? By anybody. So who controls events? Well, that's, everything is somehow topsy-turvy, you know. So it, I may quote Shakespeare here, it's a tale of an idiot. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Knin, Yugoslavia. <laughs> How many men have died for a dream and believed this is the noblest death? The dream in this remote corner of Yugoslavia is of a Serbian state they would call Krajina. In Central Europe, over centuries, millions have died in nationalist adventures. Is it worth it? <sighs> yes, yes, a hundred times yes, says Chedo. His son was killed two weeks ago while firing a bazooka at a Croatian police station in the cause of Krajina. It's a lush, lonely, mad land in the heart of Croatia. Croatia wants independence from Yugoslavia and Krajina wants independence from Croatia. In the name of all this, Cedo wants revenge for his son. And if he can't get it, Dimitri, his youngest son, will continue the battle until many Croatians have paid the price. It's like a hillbilly blood feud only between nations. He can't wait, just one more boy thirsting for revenge, growing up in a sea of hatred and fear that is called the Balkans. It seems strange, really. With Western Europe trying to unite, European nationalism seemed an evil of the past. But here in the Balkans, nationalism is alive and well, feeding off history. And the lesson of history, don't forgive or forget. In this Serb cafe near Glina, all the talk is of politics, of the breakup of Yugoslavia and fear of the Croats. We are already at war, a low-intensity civil war. We are afraid of them. We don't trust them. We have learned that history repeats itself, and we don't want to be massacred again. This was the main church of Glina. Today, there's just a monument and a museum. In July 1941, in this church, Croats slaughtered 1,200 Serbs. There was one survivor, Jednat Yuba. They told us they would convert us to Catholicism, but when they took out the knives to cut our throats, it was a sin from hell. I hid under the bodies, and so I survived. The Croats supported the German Third Reich. They formed a puppet Nazi government and settled scores with the Serbs. They killed half a million Serbs as well as gypsies and Jews. It was just the most appalling of a long list of crimes of Croats against Serbs as well as Serbs against Croats. They learned to hate at the knee. Will two-year-old Acho fear the Croats too? How can he forget? At his age, he already knows who hates him and wants to kill him. The Croats. Croatian police surround Glina as Croatia surrounds all of this small Serbian enclave. They are a feared symbol of the past. Those awful memories still drive the Serbs today, 
When they call for help from the Yugoslav army, they use emotional phrases like, the Croats are trying to install a Fourth Reich. They want to throw us out, expel us. They want to make slaves of us. They want to kill us. They really mean it. Keeping Croats and Serbs apart is the Yugoslav army, which Croats accuse of siding with the Serbs because the army is dominated by Serbia. The ethnic jumble just becomes more jumbled and menacing. But the Serbs aren't helpless, far from it. Backed up by the army, well-armed and organized, they're a formidable enemy. 2,000 armed men in Krajina, 10,000 more to call on. Training bases in every region, an armed camp. Although the town of Knina is in Croatia, the only Croatian police here are in jail, waiting for a prisoner swap. This is no local civil disturbance. It's like two nations at war, although both are just part of Yugoslavia. The head of the militia said, you have to remember one thing. There is no Yugoslavia. It's only a question of when will it fall apart and who picks up the pieces. We hate the Croats and they hate us. This is a dialogue of the dead. This is how it has always been and it will always be. Why? Who can remember? We are different people with nothing in common. Cedo sheds a tear for his son, but not many. He's proud his son died a hero's death. He says, we are warriors, we are a minority, and we must fight. But in this pretty land, the tragedy is that everyone's a minority, and they all want to fight.